Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you very much for coming to this lecture. The University of Western Australia acknowledges that its campus is situated on Noongar land and that Noongar people remain the spiritual and cultural custodians of their land and continue to practice their values, languages, beliefs and knowledge. It's now my pleasure to introduce Stuart Midgley from Doug. You can take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi everyone. Great to be here. Um, as we've sort of been chatting around, uh, I am a PhD student of UWA uh, from a very, very long time ago in the physics department. So not a lot to do with agriculture, uh, but certainly some of the stuff we've been doing recently has been in agriculture. So I'll talk a little bit about what Doug is. There'll be a few corporate slides. Um, once we get past those, I'll talk about some of the customers and projects we have running and how they're using high performance computing and advanced data analytics. Um, to offer fantastic products into the market. Um, and it, I think it'll really highlight actually um, how advanced Australian agriculture is. Um, it really is quite impressive when you look at what some of these companies are doing and what they're able to achieve. So first of all, our company um, is started in the early um, 2000s, about 2003, it's about 19 years old. The two founders, Matt and uh, the tall guy of the orange hair, and Troy was his PhD student. Uh, and they had an idea to take a product into the oil and gas industry. So we've sort of emerged from the oil and gas industry. Um, for a long time, we were developing decision support systems and data processing in the oil and gas. And recently, we've been focusing on generic um, high performance computing and taking that to the broader market. Uh, we're about 250 people, uh, we've got about 100 people, maybe 90 people here in WA. We've got a large R&D team, 40 plus people in our R&D team here in Perth. That's software developers, mathematicians, physicists, etc. We do a lot of algorithm development, um, we do a lot of data processing and writing all our own code to do that. Um, the other thing that we do, which is, is uh, I'll talk about, is we do this immersion cooling, so you can actually see a little bit of a photo of our data centre. This is our Perth data centre in the background. Uh, we have a few business units. We have um, national security in space, so we do work in that environment and our chief security officer is actually overseas attending a lot of defence conferences as we speak. Our traditional business is oil and gas data processing and then where um, Marie, Colin and myself function is in the enterprise space. So we're taking high performance computing to the world. Um, as I said, we have software analytics, um, data processing, high performance computing. We do green high performance computing, the immersion cooling um, technology which saves half our energy and, make, and we literally right now run some of the greenest data centers in the world. And then we have data processing services and we wrap it all up into a product called Doug McLeod. Um, there's a long story behind how we got to Doug McLeod, but there it is. We have four main offices globally, um, Perth's our headquarters. Uh, we have Malaysia, London and Houston. Uh, obviously oil and gas centres, uh, but Houston at the moment is running our largest computer and we have a significant system here in West Perth. We are right now going through the process of kicking off a build in Geraldton for a very large green supercomputing campus. Um, the aim is to have these large supercomputers running entirely on green energy using our energy savings technology. So that's really exciting. We have a very large and diverse customer base. Here's a photo of a few of them. As you can see, a large number of oil and gas people, but also um, a few people who are um, in the sort of health sciences and um, agriculture space, etc. We work with a lot of the universities on all sorts of research projects. So it's quite interesting. Probably something which we've, we've really focused on um, in the last probably 36 months, so three years, has been security. Um, we want to offer compute in a very, very secure environment. So if you're working on patient data, you can trust us. Our systems will handle that and, and meet your standards. If you're working on incredibly sensitive data in terms of you know, lots of IP that you don't want to get leaked out, we want that environment. So it's a lot of focus on security. And more recently that focused in, that culminated into ISO certifications that we received. So 9001 is quality management. So we have a quality management framework. Um, and so that's how we run the whole business and the, the processing system. And then we have 27001, which is information security. 
Uh, so we've met these international standards and we're now stepping from those into higher levels and defence level security standards. Um, so if the federal government and these agencies can trust their data with us, then I'm sure you all can as well. Okay, stepping off that into high performance computing. So here's a, a quote from a good mate, Professor Andrew Roll over at Curtin. Um, he's head of school, electrical engineering, computing maths, but he also used to run the Pawsey Centre. So he was the director of the Pawsey Centre. And his belief is, is that there will be no area of research that won't be using high performance computing somewhere. And as bold as that claim is, you will be really surprised where high performance computing is appearing. So I guess what I want to get out of this talk is at the end of it for you to go, I didn't know that. I had no idea that that is where supercomputers were used in agriculture and biotechnology. We're seeing a huge increase in data uh, and so the ability to process data is becoming very important. Come on in. And to process enormous quantities of data you need very big processing systems which is sort of the space we operate in. So um, as I said the, the, the quantity and quality of data is, is massively increasing. Um, we are seeing researchers racing to keep up. That's something common. We have a lot of customers who come to us purely to get help with how to do this stuff. We've got a 20 year heritage of doing it. I've been in the supercomputer industry myself for over 25 years. Um, and so we, we've got a, long, a lot of people in our business who are used to doing this sort of stuff for a very long period of time. And we help with algorithms, we help with data processing methodologies, um, we help with people just getting data throughput. Even that can be really difficult. Um, analytic challenges, storage, computation. And really it comes down to these last two things. We help a lot of people accelerate their research uh, and their translation and commercialization of IP. And I will give some ex case studies towards the end where I can concretely demonstrate how that's played out in the academic and research space. Um, so, how is HPC used outside of research? Well, um, obviously we're seeing a lot of artificial intelligence and machine learning. That's happening everywhere and I'll cover some of those. Here are some examples of AI ML being used in agriculture. This is counting individual um, citrus trees, lemon trees, orange trees, I can't remember which one, from space and doing it with hyperspectral analysis. So looking at it in different frequencies of light. And the, the red spots are trees which are having moisture problems and the green trees, the green dots are the trees that aren't having moisture problems. And so this is all happening from space. Take a photo from space, various frequencies of light and you can start to determine how your orchard is going. You can also count them individually from space. Again here we're looking, at it's a hyperspectral style map, it might look like it's um, green you know, as in the colour but it's actually artificially coloured. And again, just looking at moisture content, moisture content, sending up drones, analysing crops and dirt and all sorts of stuff from the sky. So these are some of the examples in um, agriculture and we'll touch on some of those. Obviously then, apart from just taking photos from space and drones, there's a lot of bioinformatics, a lot of sampling of um, various genomes and all that sort of stuff and bringing it all together to understand um, what's happening and to study the crops themselves. <laughs> and it's not just, it's not just modelling and, and these sorts of things that we're doing. Um, we're bringing in data from lots of different sources, CCTVs, um, satellite imagery, resources sector, again just getting sensor data coming in. For us a lot of these are very similar, they are just platforms to collect data. Um, and so these, huge, these platforms, you know, gene sequencing, you know, machines can now sequence genes so rapidly that usually people can't keep the data processing up to assemble them and put them on the scaffold and, and do genomics and that sort of stuff. So having large computing platforms able to do this and help you um, is critical to be able to keep your investments running. And if you can do a thousand genomes a day sequencing, then you need to be able to process that through a computer at that speed. Obviously we're doing a lot in the radio astronomy space and that's a huge one for WA at the moment and interestingly just about everything you can think of these days is using artificial intelligence and machine learning 
It is popping up in all sorts of interesting places and I'll touch on a few of those. So what is this thing called high performance computing? Some people think it was massing, massive computer systems, so you know, large, physically large computers connected with big networks, um, parallel programming, system administration, massive amounts of infrastructure. I often say to people that in my mind the definition of a supercomputer is if n is the number of computers you have, then the number of computers you want is n plus 1. Right? You can never ever have enough. I've met, not met anyone really who works in the HPC space who's ever bought a machine big enough to do their task. Um, so we are talking, you know, this is one looked like a couch. It's physically probably the size of all these chairs here. Um, the latest systems, and this is Frontier built in the US recently, um, they are massive buildings. Probably consuming the energy of like all of the campus here or probably the whole surrounding suburbs as well. They're big facilities, big computers, massive numbers of CPUs and cores and huge networking. They combine, it's a multidisciplinary field, they combine lots of different people, software developers. You can't just take the software off your desktop and run on a supercomputer. It just doesn't work. You actually need specialised software people. You need people who work in science, interestingly. So you have to be able to take your algorithm and break it up in a way that can run on tens of thousands of systems at once. And that's quite often not just loading up a different image or some piece of information differently on each computer. They often run these systems as a single computer, doing one computation across tens of thousands of systems. So there's specialised languages, specialised algorithms and really complex computational techniques. And I guess what I'm trying to point out here is this is a discipline unto itself. So the end scientists are quite often not skilled in most of these fields. Yes, they can do the mathematics or write the algorithm and they can run it on small scale on their computer, but to step into one of these large computing systems is a discipline unto itself. So the practicalities. Probably the one that catches most people out with high performance computing is big computers don't stop ever. They run Christmas Day, they crunch through vast amounts of work and it is actually quite hard to keep them fed. It, most people discover unless everything is automated, you cannot keep these systems running well. So you have to think of your whole pipeline from when, you know, literally trying to load the sequencer. We now have those storing their data directly on the supercomputer to be processed instantly. A whole pipeline then spits the data back to the researcher in a form that they can use immediately. And it, we try to automate everything because that's the only way you can keep stuff up. And of course, getting in the way is security. Okay, so you as a researcher will be sitting there going, oh, you know, here's a bit of data and I want to get it processed or here's a model I want to run. But of course, it might need, to not, it might need uh, personal information removed from it. Getting it onto the system may require you to jump through some hoops and pass through security layers. Um, for example, in our environment, you can't, like I did here, bring in a USB drive and just plug it in. We have a process to go through to allow that to happen. So we try to minimise security, but it is going to be there. So that is one of the practicalities of any modern um, facility, is security. Some other practicalities if you're going to jump onto a supercomputer, they're nearly always Linux. Now you don't have to be an expert in Linux, but nearly everything you use in the HPC space is going to be Linux based. You are going to be using this thing called Secure Shell. Um, so it is a secure encrypted way to access the computer. We even do remote desktop over this protocol. That's where a lot of security things. You are going to be doing what's called batch scheduling. Most supercomputers have an enormous amount of work to get through. There are thousands of people shoving work on them. And so they maintain what's called a queue. And you put your work in the queue, and then when your job gets to the top of the queue, it runs, and then the results come off. And this is where the automation comes in. That may be at 3 a.m. on a Saturday that your job gets on the machine. And you don't want it to crash straight away. You actually want it to do some useful work. We obviously, as a commercial organisation, try to minimise how long you spend. Like, so hopefully your jobs go on straight away, but it is something you need to be aware of. Automation and batching work up. 
You are going to have to use this thing called Bash. It's a Unix shell. Uh, you, again, you don't need to be an expert in it. That's where our team helps you. But just be aware, you are going to see this thing called Bash and you are going to write shell scripts. That is what a job is. You capture what you want to do in a little program and you submit the program to the system and then the system runs it and gives you back results. It's not scary. A lot of people think it is. But once you get the hang of it and you get someone like our team helping you, the first job takes a bit of effort and then after that you get in the swing of it and it all just flows pretty quickly and easily. And usually after about a year of using one of these systems, you wonder how you ever got on in your life without it. What benefits from high performance computing? What we call concurrent work. So bits of your algorithm or bits of your workflow where you are doing the same thing many times. Most of the recent computers, and you can see a picture here, so we have this is a server, this is another server, here's another server, here's another server, physical piece of computing equipment, and they're connected via a very good network. But all of these machines you can have running different work. Working on a different input file, working on a different photo from a drone, working on a different genome sequencing project, or a different genome or whatever. Um, and so you do tend to do what we call concurrent work. Submit it to the machine and away it goes. So the parts to look for in your workflow when you want to do things are parts where you do the same computation on different input, running the same workflow on lots of different samples. So if you have a thousand samples, they're all independent, put those on a thousand machines, get the result off in the same time it takes you to do one, but you've got a thousand results. You then need to be prepared to do the follow-on work with those results, but that's the sort of thing you can do. You can literally use a thousand machines, use ten thousand machines, and get ten thousand things done in the same time it takes to do one. And that's the power. You can do this parallel and, and threaded processing. Again, that's a level of complexity which in this sort of space, in the agriculture and, and health sciences and bioinformatics space, isn't common but it is certainly something which can be done. And this requires specialised programming languages and specialised environments. Again, our team has experience in all of those and they can help you. When you jump on one of these machines, a modern machine, you're going to be using these things called GPUs, graphics processing units, they, the old graphics card in your computer. So an HPC facility, and most modern HP facilities, just have thousands of GPUs. So you need to get your workflow to a GPU. Again, we can help you. There's some choices to be made. There's AMD, GPUs, NVIDIA, Intel. There's all sorts of exotic stuff. We're running a lot of these things called A100s with 80 gigs of RAM. They're the sort of the bee's knees at the moment in uh, GPU space. But again, quite often it doesn't revolve you doing anything. If you're using one of the common frameworks, PyTorch or something like that, They've done the work for you. You just have to get the command and turn the flag on. Use a GPU and then submit it to a thousand machines and bam, you're using a thousand GPUs. Um, the nice thing about high performance computing facilities over most other sort of types of computing, we're designed to cool these things. These things generate a lot of heat and a lot of energy. You put one under your desk, your legs get hot. Right? Literally a GPU puts out as much heat as your little fan radiator, little fan heater at home when you run them hard. So they generate a lot of heat and so facilities like ours are designed to cool them. We can run them 24 hours a day, 7 days a week and handle that heat. We're also designed and set up to run large workflows. So we have storage systems and infrastructure in place to actually process vast quantities of data or to do large scale modelling. And that, that is, if you come and look at our facility in West Perth, you'll see it's not insignificant infrastructure. Certainly not stuff you put in your desktop at home or in a department around the university campus. Again, a lot of people are doing AI and ML, and this is the great thing about a lot of these. If you use one of these standard packages um, or frameworks, there, someone else has done the hard work for you in getting it to a GPU or getting it on an HPC system. All you need is someone to help you get it running. And that's what our team do. Um, so we have a lot of people who like to use Jupyter, and so we offer a Jupyter Hub service for people so that you can write your notebooks, hit run, it runs on a supercomputer. Hopefully you get your results back thousands of times faster. 
So a lot of work is going, especially in this bioinformatics and uh, agricultural sort of industries, a lot of work has been done to help people get up and running quickly. So you don't need to be an expert in this to get going. And indeed, we have a lot of, for example, wet, wet lab biologists running their workflows on the platform. Their focus is wet lab biology, looking at little drops of something or other. Um, but we help them and we get all this working for them and then they're able to just process that data as they get it. So, some real world examples. Um, one that has, I've been fascinated with for a long time actually is the wheat genome. And so the wheat genome apparently is incredibly complicated. What does it say here? Five times as much DNA as the human genome and 40 times the rice genome. So the rice genome was one of the early genomes to be put together on a computer. It took a couple of years. I think it was done in the 90s. The wheat genome took all the way up to 2018 to get done because it's so complex. And that was done on some very, very, very large supercomputers in the US. So the wheat genome required high performance computing just to assemble the genome off a sequence. So they did the sequencing, collected all the information, collected all the little bits of data that then had to be aligned to form the whole genome. It took close to 20 years to do this. 14 years after the human, I remember when they kicked the human genome off, oh, I was just starting university, and they said, oh, this will take 100 years, and I think within about five years it was done. That's how quickly this um, field progressed. But it still took until 2018 to get the wheat genome done. That's how complicated it is. So it was really impressive. And, and of course, now that they have the full genome um, handled analytically, they're now starting to improve yield and make disease resistant strains and all of these sorts of things. But that's not the end of the story for wheat. So for 20 years, wheat drove supercomputers pretty hard. Okay? And that just gave us the genome. Now, they're using that information and driving artificial intelligence. So there are groups right now in Western Australia running AI on wheat. They can take a photo of a field and start to tell you what the yield is, what the strains of wheat that you have there, just from the shape, you know, these high resolution photos, just from the shape of the um, heads of wheat. They can start deriving a lot of information and they've done this by one, simulating how the various strains grow and split and form, and then two, using that to drive artificial intelligence systems to build models so they can extract that information from a photo. So they can literally drive past the wheat field, snap a photo and start to tell you a lot of information about how the wheat and the crop is performing. Really interesting stuff and that's being done on high performance computing. And again, at the end of it all is this idea that you can do cost effective, really accurate monitoring of your crop. Precision agriculture at its best. All for wheat. Again, driving supercomputing. They're now using this, of course, um, not just wheat crops, but lots of crops now. They're using AI for weed management. They put a drone up. They then, in essence, take high resolution, hyperspectral images of the ground, put it through an artificial intelligence system, and can start to identify weeds. Why? Well, it turns out that apparently if you just spray the whole paddock, you go through, you know, for these large paddocks they're doing, you know, many hectares and hundred hectares in size, you, go, you may go through a million dollars worth of chemicals to spray for weeds. If they can then get a map, upload it to the sprayer and just turn the sprayers on as they're going over the weeds, they drop down to $100,000 worth of chemicals going on the paddock. Save $900,000, better outcome for the environment, better outcome for the crop, instead of just blanket spraying. This is the sort of stuff that's happening right now. There are at least two companies now doing this, helping improve crop yields, better outcomes for our food products, doing it all off artificial intelligence. They have little supercomputers on trucks that they take out into the field to do this because they don't have communications. It's really impressive stuff and all around cost savings and better product.
I showed you a satellite image earlier that was of citrus trees. We have a customer who's using satellite imagery to count palm trees, date palms, so that a local government knows how much to tax the farmers based on how many date palms they've got. They're using sim all the same sort of technology to be able to differentiate invasive species amongst the palms. Go in, send someone in, remove whatever plant they don't want there. Um, so again, this is all being done from space. Not drones, actually taking a photo, broad swath of land and then being able to count individual date palms. Really, really amazing stuff. And you would think that you know, is this worth it? Well, absolutely, because a satellite goes over and takes photos all the time. All you need to do is capture the stream every now and again and process the data and reissue your tax bill. Um, really quite incredible. And so this will evolve from not just being our tax people, but to actual full crop management. Know how much is out there, know what the country's output is going to be. Use that for potentially saying, hey guys, how about you don't grow dates this, you know, this next 10 years, you grow this or you manage that. So it'll really come into crop management. Improving yield, you know, making sure you're not using too much water, not so, making sure you're not overtaxing the land. So really impressive stuff. Uh, again, that was with Lat Connect 60. Uh, so here's a little bit of a case study on them. What were they able to do with a high performance computer? So they got these very high resolution space imagery. It was taking them close to a month to process that data on their desktops. They could dump it on a system like ours and do it in half a day. Right, so they've gone from 30 day turnaround to half a day turnaround. If you can't, you know, if your turnaround from in essence a single sweep of the satellite is 30 days, then you just can't run it continuously. You know, you've either got to build a much bigger computer, which is what we do. Then you can turn it around quickly, and then when the satellite comes over for its next sweep, you can capture the data and process it. You can keep up, whereas at 30 days you can't. So they came on our platform. They really have really enjoyed it. As I said, they've been able to turn their data around much more quickly, which completely changes the type of business they're offering. Real-time analysis, well, near real-time analysis of data uh, into these industries. We do a lot of work with Harry Perkins. Um, so we do a lot of their genome assembly and, and what's it, proteomics and phenomics and stuff. It's all beyond me, I'm a physicist. Um, but look, they, they really enjoyed it because again, they were a lot of wet lab biologists and that, and they weren't data processing people. And so we solved their data processing component. They knew what they wanted to do, they knew how to do those bits, but they just weren't in any way used to handling the volume of data that was coming off systems. Um, so some of the, you know, this vast thing I talk a lot about, this high performance storage made a huge difference to their lives. They could actually just manage the volume of data they had. Um, another one where we're using AI, and still I guess in agriculture, but this is on fire safety. So being able to, from um, space satellite imagery, track fire bushfires, well first of all, spot them early. So actually be able to pinpoint where the bushfire started, get it early alert that there's a bushfire being ignited, send someone out and fight it. This involves a lot of separation of cloud from smoke, which is a very complicated thing, but they're now able to do it. They can use it given vegetation maps, given wind direction, given they know what the current shape of the fire front is, they can accurately predict where the fire is going to go and where to concentrate resources. They can use that to control how the fire propagates through the landscape. Uh, keep it away from farms, know where to put fire breaks, etc. They can do all that modelling on a supercomputer and deliver it. And FDL is now building a product to deliver this to your iPad in the field so firefighters get real-time information in the field. Every time a satellite goes over, do all this analysis, provide the latest details, do all this modelling and tell them where the fire is, where it's going. Much more accurate um, firefighting. Uh, we do a lot of work with hostile ships. Again, you know, it's building ships, but what are they really doing? They're modelling ships using artificial intelligence. So they help, they have an artificial intelligence system which helps design the ship, and then once they've designed a ship, they then put it through the normal physical modelling. Uh, but it cuts out a lot of just the pre testing to come up with a good design for a boat. Uh, so they're using a lot and use our expertise. This is one which I think is really interesting in the academic space. So uh, we worked with Professor Kath Trott from uh, ICRA at Curtin. She's 
We've been trying for, well, close to a year to process data um, coming off the Murchison Widefield Array. Uh, we worked with her, made the process go about 125 times quicker. She was able to process six years worth of data, which was, she was predicting going to take her at least two more years. We processed that in a couple of days. Present, she was then able to get the results. Now, sounds great. Ran really fast. She got results out two years ahead of time. She submitted her paper, got her paper out two years ahead of time, and in a, in a year she's got over 90 citations. So she went from being, in essence, just a follower in the field to now leading the field. Now, if we follow that logic on, and this is actually just starting to happen literally right now, because she's now the leader in the field, um, because she can process her data more rapidly, she's picked up more federal funding, She's picked up more international funding for her research group and she's growing the, the research group quite rapidly. And that's sort of, from that of course, once you get bigger research groups and more PhD students, you obviously start to uh, get more papers and, and then you really lead the field. So we've continued that relationship and again we've just done a similar process for them, looking at a whole heap of legacy data that they were unable to process, put it through the big computer really rapidly for them and allow them to start publishing papers much earlier than they thought they were ever going to be able to do. Again, in the, um, in the sort of astronomy space, there's this thing called FRB detection, fast radio burst detection. Um, spotting these things in, in data is really difficult. It's especially difficult if you can't process the data rapidly. You've got huge volumes of data, petabytes of data you need to search for this one particular signal. Uh, and it's very, very complicated, but again, with a big system, you can actually do it and start to pick up these signals and they're now starting to publish, oh yeah, we found this one now and we found this one, all based on the back of what we've done on a big supercomputer. So again, that will start to drive their research group, grow it, um, attract more funding, etc. Um, so what do we do? Well, I, I perhaps I, I hope I've sort of indicated that what, what a lot of what our company does is help people. Yes, we're a commercial supercomputing outfit, um, but we do have a lot of compute capacity that people can get on and use. And you can use it sort of in your own time. Okay, so you can jump on and we, you are in essence our customer, we work for you, and so if you have problems, we solve them so that you can get on and get running. Uh, we have a large amount of um, what we call domain specific expertise, and I'm a physicist, we have molecular dynamics people, we have people who've come from the uh, bioinformatics space to help with the genomics processing. All that team are scientists, I'm a PhD scientist, who found the computing more interesting. <laughs> right? So we really love the computing side but we have the science background to be able to at least understand what you want to achieve. And so that's what we do. We're very good at making your pipelines run efficiently on big systems. We know how to use the storage system, we know how to use the networking etc to do that. And ultimately what this does is make your research go faster. Uh, we had one PhD supervisor, he loves us because we push his PhD students. He doesn't have to nag them all the time. We can be the bad cop. Come on, where's your data? Let's get some more data on guys. Let's get some stuff processed. And so you know, we drive the PhD students for him. Um, our, our, some of our sticking points, or some of our, some of our sticking points, so some of our um, differentiators to other cloud providers, data sovereignty. We are in West Perth. Our data, your data's held here. Um, we don't track it off elsewhere. You can come and, in essence, look at your data. Uh, we offer green computing, so we, as I said, we are running right now, um, globally, some of the greenest data centres. We've got international awards to show for that. Uh, we have a very strong focus on cyber security and data, data security integrity. Um, but, you know, they're great to have, you know, as, as I think Colin quite often says, they're the tick boxes. Need to have those for me to be able to use sensitive data on your platform. Once you've got that, actually people just want the help. If you have a problem and you get stuck, you've got somewhere to go to get it solved. We have customers, you know, they're using AlphaFold. Complicated package to get up and running, complicated even on your desktop to get working properly. Really complicated to get running on a big system. But that's what our team does. And when you have a problem with AlphaFold, they go, oh, okay, here's the problem, and they'll go and fix it for you, and then you're up and running. Um, so you don't need to be an expert in some of these fields. Um, again, what do we do? We have a, a world-class supercomputing platform and system. We support you through your entire journey, um, which is 
Surprisingly, in the HPC field, incredibly important. Most people are not expert in this huge multidisciplinary field. And we provide a complete environment. So with a lot of the public clouds, when you jump on, you get a thousand computers. What the heck? How do you string them together? How do you join them up? What version of Linux should you use? All of these sorts of questions. We just provide it all for you. It's all set up, all running. All the software can be there and running. Uh, just come on, run your data, run your models. And we've been doing this for a long time. I guess that's uh, runs on the runs on the ground matter a lot. You know, we pick products like this vast storage and our networking and that, which are proven to work. We don't leave it to chance. When a lot of people set up labs, they don't know all these little intricate details. But you know, after a few years of bashing their head against it, they know. But you can save yourself that time. And so that's again the way we've set the system up is for large-scale data processing and modelling. And we're green. I can't, it's really hard for people to understand how important this is. Um, if you come up to our facility, I'll explain it. So we have a little room. It's uh, probably double the size of this room. Okay, that's our data center. Maybe not even double the size of this room. We do what's called a megawatt of energy through that room. That's a thousand households worth of energy going through that room. That one little room. We dump, supercomputers dump out a lot of energy. To put that into perspective, if you go down and you would have seen the big black box on top of the polypipe, the next DC data center, they're using half the energy for that eight story building or seven story building, whatever it is, they use half the energy of our little room. They don't do high performance computing. High performance computing uses a bucket load of energy. Uh, and we put it through computers and when you do computation it takes a lot of energy. And so we, and our technology, saves half of that. And that's sort of the crux. For us, that means over a million bucks a year in, in power that we save. Um, and so these are, these, you know, the cooling is very significant. The side benefit is we can cool hot stuff. GPUs. We have worked with a customer who literally had the GPUs in desktops under their desks right up until they had a fire. They caught fire and burnt the computer and their desk. Luckily, they put it out. But that was because over the weekend, you know, air conditioner goes off, computer got really hot, something shorted out, started a small fire. And that's a real customer. Um, so these things, you know, if they're not in a proper environment, can become problematic. Um, so again, it, it's power and energy and all of these things are critically important and are what separate high performance computing from everything else. So yeah, come and have a look. It's really interesting. And you can click on us, link, find us on LinkedIn, etc. That's all I have. Anyone have any questions? Um, Marie can. And then we've got on demand, which means that at any one time you can just use what you want. So you come on the system, you run your job, you get off. You are only charged for the time that you're running on the machine. And um, we've got vast storage as our storage for processing. So when you when you get your job on, it goes onto that storage, runs on the machine, comes back off, you take off your data. You can also store it with it on online archive, which is really cheap storage. It's spinning disk storage, mm. so it's, it's, you know, it's not any archive. So when you, when you go to a lot of the public clouds and you'll see this glacier storage, um, that's actually a tape storage product. 
So your latency to get your data is really long. You could wait, you know, you request it, it's got to physically go and get a cartridge, put it in a machine, read the data off. Everything we do is in the high performance space. So we like to provide people instant access to their data and an instant ability to process data. The reality is we have a range of hardware. It's at lots of different prices. Um, the level of commitment adjusts, in essence, how that price is. And that's really just around knowing how big a machine we need. Mm -hmm. And so. do you have a period, you know, when you start a new project with a new client where you have to actually optimise the processes and the, you know... The, yes. The, yeah. So in essence, that period is the whole lifetime of the project. Um, our support team sit there on Slack, if you know Slack at all, it's just one of these online chat channels, where you can just type away to them and they help you. But they're there for the whole time, they're for your whole journey. So typically the way that works is obviously at the start, a large amount of use, and then after that it's only when things go wrong. Um, but we have customers who will do one project, run for three or four months, get everything running really well, and then that becomes a production thing, and then do another project. Um, so certainly Kath Trot was in that space. She had a whole heap of data and got a process and then she went away for a few months, you know, generated the papers and had the scientific output, come back now with a different project. So again, you sort of start that learnings again. Um, they obviously have bring some learnings with them, but then obviously it's a different code and different data and different sizes and volumes, etc. And so they need that, that assistance again. Mm -hmm. So it really varies. Um, the support side of things is just provided as part of the service. Mm. Um, and also we charge by node hours, so it's only when your job starts to run that the clock starts ticking. The minute your job finishes, it stops. So with a lot of the public clouds, it's the, the clock starts ticking from the instant you say turn the computer on. And it stops ticking when you turn the computer off. Now you may leave it only on for the length of your work, or you may leave it on for, you know, ad infinitum. Uh, and so a lot of people turn the computer on, you know, set a job running, it finishes Saturday afternoon, but of course, you know, they're out with the kids playing soccer and they don't get to turn off till Sunday, and so they get charged for time when it sits idle. The batch scheduling system does away with all of that. So when your job sits in the queue, it's not being charged. But when it actually gets on a machine and gets running, then, then it's, the cost starts going, and then when it comes off the machine, it stops. So it's quite a different way. Like, again, because you're dealing... Typically on a high performance computer, you are dealing with thousands of machines or hundreds of machines. And so if something happens, it happens to a hundred machines. <laughs> and so we, we have to manage it quite carefully and, and make sure that when you ask for a certain resource, you've got it. Because people in the HPC space, when they say, I'm going to use a terabyte of RAM, they use a terabyte of RAM. But, you know, they're not like a lot of enterprise program, enterprise computing where you know, they go and buy a big computer, but they're actually only running on a teeny amount of it. Most people in the HPC space use everything they can get their hands on. So we have to manage it quite carefully and, and, and control it really well. So it is, it is different in that sense. And that's where a proper facility helps a lot because to set that up and do it yourself is actually really complicated. Whereas, you know, we've been doing it for 20 years. I've been doing it for more than 20 years. Um, and so we have that learnings over a large period of time to, to make it work well. And you're obviously yeah. putting more capacity in. We're place. always growing capacity. Yeah. We're, we're putting on, especially the GPUs, the latest GPUs, as fast as we can get them. Uh, we have so many customers for it, it's not funny. Well, oh, sorry, we had one over. So I've got lots of questions. <laughs> What are our challenges in this space? Our, our challenges are generally around power, um, getting enough power. Um, yeah, and, and getting it at a price that, that, that is suitable. We're quite different to a lot of power users. Um, if Even a normal data centre, like as I said, NextDC's data centre here is one example. If you go to the NextDC data centre in Sydney, the biggest data centre in Australia, um, they notionally have 80 megawatts. They're only using two. With us, we take a megawatt and we use a megawatt. Right? We, we absolutely push everything to the limit because that's a generally our constraint. 
Uh, we can buy more machines. If we have more power, we buy more machines and use the power. Um, and so that's generally how we go. And that's why cooling is so important for us. So power and cooling are huge problems. Yeah, right now, hardware's hard to get. You know, the supply chain issues are biting. They're getting better. But it's only because of the demand. Because yeah, the we've got such a high demand just trying to keep the hardware coming in in this current environment is tough. Um, but the power and cooling is our long term. That's why we want to build Geraldton. We want to be at least up to 100 megawatts. We want to be able to just keep growing and growing and putting in more hardware to keep up with customer demand. Just on that point, I mean, as a lateral thought, I actually live in Switzerland and I have no. I cannot conceptualise the sort of heat and all this you're talking about. But uh, where I live, um, it's very, very green and the whole sort of trying to cycle thing. So they, they actually, there's a very big ice skating rink and all the heat from the refrigeration heats the Olympic swimming pool that's yep. next door. So I just wonder whether you thought um, about Secondary that. use of heat is, is a real thing um, in terms of computing. Yeah. A, little, a little bit of the problem, so when you freeze ice in essence, you have what's called high quality heat. So you have a refrigeration system, and, well, the opposite, well, you have a refrigeration system which puts out, like your air conditioner, hot, hot air on the other side. And with a refrigeration system, you can get that hot air up to 80, 90 degrees Celsius. Um, and then you can use that to heat water up to 30 or 40 degrees and put it into a pool. A little bit of the problem we have here is that the, we don't use refrigeration. We don't have a big fridge to cool our um, oil down in this case uh, because that costs you a lot of energy to run that fridge and so we only get 35 to 40 degree air out so it's actually a different um, idea to be able to reuse that heat most data centers suffer from this problem there are some data centers which recycle their heat uh, and do that you now we're working with a group in the Netherlands who are heating towns during winter but then you get to summer Okay, so in essence, you double up on your infrastructure, which again costs a lot of money and effort and, and all sorts of things. So it's, it's, it's very mixed how effective it is. Um, yeah, I mean, in summer, Olympic, at least in Australia, they don't want heat. So what do you do with it? Um, it's very difficult. Um, so the way that the, the scheduler works yeah. is that you say to the scheduler, I need this much memory yeah. and I need this many cores. Yeah. And then it puts it on a machine with that. Is there an upper limit to that based on or nope. there for that? No. Nope, it's as many as you want or as few as you want. Or actually it's as many as you want to pay for and as few as you want to pay for. Again, because it's a commercial service, we don't put limits on you. If you want to use a million cores, we go for it. We've got them use them uh, and you can get them tomorrow. You don't have to wait six months or a year for allocation process. Uh, we, we just make them available and, that, and we just continuously grow. So, you know, previously we were buying a lot of this type of CPU. You know, they're now old and so this year we're buying this CPU and so now, now we're building up huge volumes of that type of thing and we're buying this type of GPU. But next year the new NVIDIA H100s come out and so then we'll just cut over and start buying lots of H100s. And so we, you know, we just buy hardware all the time and, and it's what really what, what customers want in terms of what they tell us they want to use and we just make sure we've got it. You mentioned uh, causes uh, in your talk. How does your facility compare with causes and is it reasonable to compare, say, uh, in terms of size? Right now we're about three times bigger um, in Perth. Than, than what their facility is. Um, when they are fully upgraded, sometime next year I think, um, they'll be bigger than us, but probably about the size of what we have in Texas. Uh, and then you know, we'll see where we get to in terms of what we've bought in between. So, so we, we're continuously buying new hardware and getting rid of old hardware and buying new hardware. So um, our actual capacity at any given time is, is well, it's always growing. So. Instead of having you know big step changes, we're just continuously growing. I guess a lazy question is: it, what do you see as your main selling point versus using causes, which is potentially free to 
Yep, uh, absolutely. Um, I mean, probably the, for an academic research community, we don't put restrictions in, in any, really in any dimension other than dollars. So, for example, we've had students come on who, you know, if you have to wait a year to get an allocation, then you know, you're a third of the way through a PhD. You can get on straight away. Um, we have people who, our system is actually really well set up for, for large-scale data processing, which is what Kath Trott wanted with the MWA. So she was struggling just to get the, the data through on the public facilities, uh, and we were able to shove it through, my, well, you know, because it doesn't matter when you, when you buy it and you're going to buy X size. It doesn't matter whether you get it all in one day or you spread it out over a year. It's the same dollars. You can either buy a thousand machines for one day or, a, or one machine for a thousand days. Same cost. So why not just take it all in one day and get your job out and then really push ahead on the science front. So it's those sorts of things that, that we operate really well in. Um, some people don't get time on the public facilities. You know, they're not a, a lot of bioinformaticians really struggle because they're not sophisticated users. They're wet lab biologists or they're you know, doing other things. Supercomputing and data processing is not their thing. Uh, and so getting the assistance and getting the help and that deep knowledge to help them get up and running is, is something which is valued a lot. And we get a lot of people, you know, Harry Perkins and TKI and uh, etc. So the thing we, we commercial service, we can't afford to go down. Yep. So if you're running on us, you're running. <coughs> and the other thing is the support, I guess the support is on tap all the time. Um, and we, if you've got grant money that's about to expire, you can wait to give us. So that we give you another year to actually, you know, you can hold it for that amount of time. Um, but we always think we do better support for completely other kinds of research grants. Yeah, so it's quite a different environment. I mean, actually, I was one of the people who set Pawsey up. <laughs> so our system runs very similarly. We use the same batch scheduler. We use parallel file systems. We have different hardware and different types of hardware, but um, they, so they run. Like no. You know, but we're on tap. Yeah. You know, you can use us, not use us. Um, use us when you want, how you want. We don't do things like, we don't limit job run times. We don't say, you know, if it's a, using a thousand machines, can only run for four hours? Well, we don't care. We know the machines will stay up. We've got that under control. We can keep machines up. Most of our machines are up and running for over a year. So you can run long running, large jobs. We don't stop them. You're paying for it, so why would we stop it? Um, it's, it's a real user focused system. So you don't have more time? Nope. You can if you want. Like, that's the other thing. We try and give customers control and work how you want to work. So for example, if you want your queues set up a particular way, just tell us, we'll set your queue up. We have students on the system and the lecturers go, I only want my students to have two minute run times. Yeah, that's fine. We put a limit, two minutes. After two minutes, their jobs get killed. Stops them mining. Stops, <laughs> stops them um, you know, having a runaway job and incurring infinite cost. Um, so yeah, we, we kill them. Their job stop. They can, if they want and get, prove that they're getting better, they can ask ask the lecturer, and the lecturer sets it up to be longer running. Or we have researchers who just want to run a job for seven, eight days at a time, no problems. Goes on a machine, runs for seven or eight days, get the results. So there's lots of dimensions um, that we function. We're just really user focused. So. Sorry, I've got some more questions. Um, two questions. Plant breeding companies. I don't think so. I can't, not off the top of my no. head. I can't, I can't recollect that we have, but I'll have to go open our database. Yeah. But um, not, not specifically plant, plant breeding. We don't necessarily know what all our customers do. So um, we do have a lot of commercial people doing genomics and, and all of that. No idea what they do. I mean, we know, what, we know that they're you know, assembling genomes and doing all sorts of stuff, but actually for what industry, you know, no, no idea. Yeah. And I guess that's a segue into my next question on intellectual property. How do you deal with that? Like, you oh, know, it's not ours. Yeah, so even if you a process where you can speed things up. The data sits with all our clients. Yep. Uh, right. we, we just provide the capability and the service, as a student Marie's outlined today, to allow you to run the job to determine your outcome so that you can make the next decision. But the IP is all owned by all of our clients. Yeah, we don't own it. 
We don't, I mean, we're a facility. We just provide the hardware. Same as if you're on a public cloud. You get on, the hardware's there, you run, it's all yours. You know, we do a lot of things to help you. So, for example, all our storage is encrypted at rest. So if we go and set a disk out to get replaced, no one can get your data. So we do all those sorts of things. That's just part of our normal service. Um, but, you know, we don't, we don't keep your data. Your data is protected from everyone else on the system. So no one can even snoop around and see your data. No one even knows you're on the system. They can't see you in any way. Uh, again, it's very private and protected, uh, which is sort of, again, in that security vein. That's why we do what's called bare metal. So when you, take, when you come with us, you get a whole machine. There's no one else on it. No one else can sniff around. No one else can accidentally run one of these hacks to try and see who's on it and steal your data. You are the only person on it. Uh, and so it's all these little things we do. Again, it's, we, we work with the world's largest oil and gas companies. You know, you can't have Shell and Ex ExxonMobil on the machine being able to see each other, and that's how we're set up and function. Our role, our role, and I think Stuart touched on his presentation, our role is very much to help organisations accelerate that translation of that research, so you get an outcome, but also to accelerate the commercialisation of the IP, right? So as more and more organisations are looking to either spin out or, or try and commercialise to an industrial application, I think that's where we play a role. But, but to answer your question, the data is never owned by us. We will process it for you, we'll, we'll store it, we'll archive it for you, as was outlined, but it's always owned by you or your organisation. The only th potential thing we might steal from you is the ability to say, hey, we work with this person. Yeah. <laughs> 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 only if you're happy to. Yeah, I think this issue makes a good point. We're always looking, I mean, you know, we have some great examples of reference sites and clients that we can share with you. Well, I mean, all of these, yeah. Um, and these, are, these organisations that, that, that you know, have allowed us to, um, to sort of showcase and case study the, the work that we do from that perspective. Because it's, it's very broad. I mean, as you can see, you've got multinational, multi-global organisations, and then you've got smaller sort of local, local start-up organisations as well. Mm -hmm. So we've got the whole spectrum there. But mm -hmm. right across the spectrum from oil and gas to mining to health med medical life sciences, ag tech, and then we go into areas like climate, weather modelling, gaming, you know, all of those all of those industries require high performance computing to move the needle and get a competitive advantage. Yeah, I mean this is just a, a small sample of who who we work with. Yeah. Um, there's a lot more and some of them, you know, are, are bigger, some of them are smaller. Um, we have customers who only basically only use us because they want a common place for all their people to work and they don't do a huge amount of compute, a couple hundred hours a month. Uh, and then we have customers who are one person and they'll do tens of thousands of hours a month um, and everything in between. I'm, I'm so, I mean, for those of you that are just interested, this week is, is the Oz Biotech Conference at uh, the Perth Convention Centre, running from Wednesday to Friday. And um, on Thursday, I'll be speaking about the, the role of high performance computing in the ag tech supply chain. So for those that are interested, it's probably worthwhile coming along to, uh, to the conference and then come along to the respective sessions that you think are more suitable for you. Um, I didn't have a chat with you afterwards if you've got time, but do you ever consider doing pro bono work for really big global challenges, particularly for the developing world, where there's not... We have, yeah. um, and we have done some work in that space, but... Uh, it's not something we've we've done a huge amount of work of space in. So and you're a commercial operation. Yeah, and we consider everything. Um, to be fair, we, we we do we do a lot of work with the research communities, at least here in in Australia, uh, in that space. So we're going in with grants, you know, putting a lot of pro bono work into what they want to do. Um, so yeah, we do we do do some work in that area. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. We're up just up Kings Park Road, yeah. the corner of Thomas Street and Kings Park Road on the corner um, opposite, um, what is it, Bagot Road, Kings Park Road and Thomas Street going through the middle. So.
know if there are any hands-on training opportunities or any internship kind of opportunities? We, we, yes, we do do internships and that. Um, uh, I personally am not involved with how those are run, but in, in our various groups we do do internships and that. So it's definitely worth, if you want, drops an email. And yeah. it, it goes into the HR group, I guess, and they manage the process. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we do do it. Well, I should just send an email to Maria and she'll forward yeah. on to our HR department and, and, and they'll coordinate for the event. But they oversee and support all the respective departments with regards to internships yeah. and so on. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you.